This is the NBC University Theater, presenting another in our series of radio plays based on the world's great stories. Tonight, the George Du Maurier novel, Peter Ibbotson, starring Joseph Schildkraut. <laughs> The story of Peter Ibbotson by George du Maurier was first published in 1891. There are those living who can remember when it first cast its spell, a spell which still holds. It was a book for those who love to dream and those who dream of love, and a book, above all, for those who share love's dream. And yet, our story begins... In the gloom of a cell in an asylum for the criminally insane... In the light of a feeble lamp, the gaunt figure of a man lies dead. His hair is white, his face is pale from long imprisonment. But on his face is the look of one who sleeps with pleasant dreams. On the desk beside him is a fading letter, an envelope that contains some crumbling violets, and the clear pages of a manuscript in which he had written... If at the time this manuscript is read, anyone remembers me, it is most certainly with pity or with scorn. Yet of all who ever lived on this earth, I have been perhaps the happiest. To tell you how this came about, I must begin long ago. Although I'm English and I'm called Peter Ibbotson, from the time I was five till I was twelve years old, I lived in Paris, in a place called... Passy le Paris. I remember the winding flagstone street lined with chestnut trees and the oil lamps alight at dusk. There was the flowering garden with the ivy covered wall and the rose trellised gate. And there was the park, a wonderland of tanglewood, with a little lake brimming with the blue of the summer sky and and there was Mimsy. Yes. There was Mimsy, the sad, pale little girl who lived beyond the garden gate, too weak to run and play with the rest of us. Go, go. Go, go. Are you going to the lake in the woods? Yes, Mimsy. See, I have a boat. A boat that sails. It's a pretty one. The prettiest I ever saw. You can come, too. But hurry up. No, Gogo. It's too far. I can't keep up with you. Too far? Oh, no. I can carry you on my shoulders if you get tired. Oh, would you, Gogo? And will you both sail to Africa? To India? To America? Of course it will. We can sail it anywhere. Yes, I guess we can. If we pretend hard enough. In the wintertime, we sat in the chimney corner and roasted chestnuts while we watched the fire. And I read, with Mimsy looking over my shoulder, her favorite verse about the waterfowl. He who from zone to zone guides through the boundless sky thy certain flight in the long way that I must tread alone will lead my steps aright. And sometimes we heard my mother play the harp as lightly as the snowflakes dancing in the early winter dusk. Frère Jacques, Frère Jacques, dormez-vous, dormez-vous. Sonne le matine, sonne le matine. Ding, ding, dong, ding, ding, dong. And then my mother's harp drifted off into a world of shadows as gentle and friendly as those that flickered from the hearth. Pa 
Passy le Paris was many things to a little boy. Games to play and Mimsy's pale face and solemn eyes. My mother's gentle voice and a home so safe and warm. And the little lake in the woods so calm and so quiet. But the days in Paris ended. Gogo, what kind of a name is that for a boy? That is what they've always called me, Colonel Libertson. You may call me uncle if you like. Of course, I'm only a cousin of your mother's. But I understand that you left quite alone in the world. Yes. Yes, uncle. It's a good thing your mother wrote to me before she died. Are we going to go home soon, Uncle Libertson? Presently, my boy, presently. Then we'll have to see about a school, a good school, where they'll teach you some real discipline. I never knew quite why Colonel Ibbotson wanted to take care of me after my father was killed in an accident and my mother died of the shock soon afterward. At any rate, he sent me off to school, the dark and gloomy Blue Friars School, for six long years. I suppose you were allowed to daydream in class when you went to school in France, Master Ibbotson. Well, perhaps this ruler on your knuckles will help to wake you up. Oh! I say, you fellows, come along to my diggings. I've got a treat from home. They've sent you another treat already? Why, it's no time since the last one. Maybe you'd best get out of this, Ibbotson. You never show a treat. Well, I would if I got one. After six years, when I was 18, I joined Uncle Ibbotson at Hopshire Hall. But there things were even worse. The colonel hated the thought that I was taller and stronger than he was, that I had ideas of my own, and that I had a standard apart from his. I should have known better than to take you in. You're your father's son, all right. And proud of it, Colonel Ibbotson. What's there to be proud of? He left you a penniless whelp, didn't he? If your mother hadn't been a fool, she'd never have married him. I think that I'll be leaving now. Oh, no, you won't. Not after all I've done. You've done more than enough and said more than enough out of your foul mouth and mind. What? Now I'll stand aside. I'll show you. Take that. <clears throat> I'll not bother to hit you back. It's worth a slap to me to get out of this. You're a coward. Stand aside. For if I ever do strike you, you'll never insult anyone again. Huh? Well, good riddance, then. But I'll square accounts with you. After that, I went to London and was apprenticed to an architect. I did well in my work, but I was miserable and I was lonely. A few more years went by and gradually I realized what I had longed for. I arranged a vacation, took my savings, and sailed to France, to Paris. I walked the once familiar streets, and my heart cried for the past. Memory. Memory is not enough when one seeks the touch of a vanished hand, the sound of a voice that is still, the tender grace of a day that is dead. And so I sat on the terrace of a small cafe and wished to God that I had never come. And then a gay open carriage clattered down the road and stopped. Two ladies and their escorts made their way to the terrace and I found myself staring, spellbound at one of them. For suddenly it seemed that her loveliness was what I had been seeking. That her eyes, her smile, held the wonder of the long ago. After she was gone, I inquired about her. I was told that she was no less than the Duchess of Towers. Never was a room more lonely than my room that night. 
As I went to sleep, visions, visions of the past flashed before me, and then I dreamed. I dreamed I stood by a little lake in the woods, and there were children running about at play, but no, 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 they, they weren't the children I'd known, no, they were evil, misshapen little dwarfs that jeered at me, and then they picked up stones, I, I turned to run to the avenue gate to escape, and there stood the Duchess of Towers, smiling. Don't run away, and don't be frightened. No, Something is wrong. Please, I, I must get away from here. No, nothing's wrong, except that you're not dreaming true. What? Not dreaming true? Yes. Give me your hand. See? Those little people don't exist. Yes. Yes, they've gone away. Please, please don't let go of my hand. I Now I can see everything just as it was. Of course you can. You're dreaming true because you have my hand. But you must try by yourself. Try hard. Yes. Yes, I'll... I'll try hard. That's strange. It's winter now instead of spring. And look, look. There. There in the chimney corner. He who from zone to zone guides through the boundless sky thy certain flight... In the long way that I must tread alone will lead my steps. <clears throat> my father taught me to dream true. And it's easy if you never cease to think of where you want to be until you're asleep. You see, you must join the dream on the reality. And you must never forget in your dream where and what you were when awake. Frère Jacques, Frère Jacques, dormez-vous, dormez-vous. Sonnez les matines, sonnez les matines. Ding, ding, dong, ding. I must go now. No. But will you remember to dream true? I'll try, but I don't know without your help. Whenever I... you come here, you will be safe. For you too must be a part of my dream. And I am glad to have you come. But I must leave you now. And so, goodbye. I awakened in my room... And I remembered every detail of my dream, or was it a dream? For I had known just who I was, and it had all been real. And so was the Duchess of Towers, so very real, why I, I still could feel the touch of her hand on mine. Well, my vacation ended, and I returned to London and to my occupation. And then one day I was summoned to the home of Mrs. Dean to consult her about some plans for remodeling her home. She was holding a party that night, and I was asked to stay. It's very kind of you to ask me to join your party, Mrs. Dean. After all, I'm practically a total stranger to you. Oh, you're not quite a stranger to me. You see, I knew Colonel Ibbotson once. Colonel Ibbotson? I'm sorry, Mrs. Dean, but... Yes, yes, I knew him once. That is, I know him now, but we were friends at one time. I beg your pardon, Mrs. Dean. I must tell you that if you wish to speak of Colonel Ibbotson as a friend, you should speak to someone else. You've answered the question I hardly knew how to ask. I wanted to know how you felt toward him. I despise him, Mrs. Dean. I despise him from the bottom of my heart. That is all I need to know just now. I'll only say that I loathe him. Loathe him with reason. Someday, perhaps, I'll tell you more. Oh, but not now. This is a party. There is someone I want you to meet. The Duchess of Towers is here. The Duchess of Ta No, I'm sorry. Oh, I couldn't. No, 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 no really. You mustn't be so shy, so modest. She asked about you. She asked? All right. I thank you very much. I'll be very happy to meet her. It may 
may seem strange or even forward, Mr. Ibbotson, but when I saw you tonight, it seemed that I had seen you before. You remind me of a little French boy I used to know when I was a girl in France. But I was a little French boy once, Your Grace. My name was changed to Peter Ibbotson when I came to England. Once I was called Gogo Pasquier. Gogo? Gogo, do you remember Mimsy? You used to carry me on your back. Mimsy? Poor, pale little Mimsy. And now so beautiful. Why, this is almost as strange as the dream I had. I mean, strange in the same way that it's so real. You see, I dreamed that I was back in Passy and everything was as it, is, as it was before. You understand that you were there and, and we saw Gogo and Mimsy. Gogo and Mimsy? Yes. I, I thought it was all my dream, but it was your dream too. Why, I didn't dream our dream together. I must go now. No, please. It's all too strange. I, I don't know what to think. And I don't know if I shall ever meet you again. Please, please stay. You must... No, I can't. Someday, perhaps, I'll write. But no. I can only say goodbye. And wherever you go, may heaven bless you. After that, in my outer life, I sought for her in vain. But in my inner life, I dreamed. Dreamed the true dreams that had become the only reality to me. But even in dreams, I couldn't find her. I couldn't find, find her. Perhaps a year went by, and again I was summoned by Mrs. Dean. Mr. Riverson, I hope that I would never have to tell you this, for it is not pleasant to tell and will be not pleasant for you to hear. And I suppose that it's something about Colonel Ibbotson? I told you once that I had been a friend of his, perhaps more than a friend. When I broke off with him, he never forgave mm, me. Yes, that would be like him. Now that I've been happily married to another, he threatens me with all kinds of evil gossip. Yes, Mrs. Dean, that would be like him too. He wrote me a letter once, which I have kept for you. Is that the letter? May I see it, please? In it, he boasted, boasted to me, that he took you in, not as an orphan, but his own son. His son? But why? I mean, why, why should he do such a thing? I think he loved your mother once. My m Just as he would now hurt me, he would hurt her. Hurt even her memory. Hurt her through you. My m it's but, difficult to believe that a man could be so evil. Perhaps you could warn him. Put a stop to all this. Yes, you're quite right. The letter here bears out just what you say. With your permission, Mrs. Dean, I will take this letter with me. Well, well, my Apollo of the T-Square. I'm surprised to see you here. I have come to ask you why you lie about my mother. Why you say I'm your son. What? Who says that? It's a lie. It is not a lie. And stay away from that door. This is a rather heavy cane I have. Of course it's a lie. Something made up by a spiteful mistress. She was never your mistress any more than my mother was. It's not a lie. I have a letter here to prove it. Come, come, my boy. You're quite beside yourself. Now, look here. I want a letter from you in which you admit that you're a braggart and a liar. I'll give you no such letter, but I'll give you this. Put down that knife. You... I'll put it down your throat. You'll not make All a fool right, of me. Yes, you go. Go. The cane crashed on his skull again and again, even after the knife he had seized from a desk was dropped from his lifeless hand. my trial, I would not him. I, I could not tell just why I had killed him. It was a nightmare of words, and at last the judge in his black cap sentencing my execution. The hours were filled with nightmares until the last day came, the last night, and then reconciled to hopelessness, I fell asleep in my prison cell.
I walked along the old avenue and through the woods. I spoke to old familiar faces to tell them of my trouble, but they couldn't hear me. And then I stood beside the little lake. Oh, Peter, I've been waiting and waiting for you night after night. Mimsy, Mimsy, I, I dared not even dream of finding you here. I almost came to see you at the prison. If you had not come, I would have come to see you there. Mimsy, I swear... I never meant to take a life, even such a miserable one. I know that is true. I know. But I have this to tell you. Your sentence will be commuted to imprisonment. I saw the Home Secretary oh, this no, afternoon. No, 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 not imprisonment. But wait, you do not understand. I have been in a prison too these past years. But now the Duke of Towers and I are to be separated, I'll be free. Free? Mimsy, then you'll be free to love someone more worthy. Oh, no, listen to me, Peter, for I must go. Tomorrow morning in your cell, you will receive a letter from me. And do you see those violets by the bank of the lake? Violets, yes, of course I see them. I will send you violets. In token of the times we shall share by our lake in dreams to come. Will that convince you? Just your saying so is enough for me. There is no prison that can hold a dream. I know now that we shall soon be here again, Mimsy, and I shall come. The hours. I awoke in my cell, and in the morning there was a message that my sentence had been changed to life imprisonment, as Mimsy had told me in our dream. And there was a letter. A letter containing violet. There was no sadness in my heart as I began to serve the days of my sentence. No sadness at all, for the night must fall after every day. And so it was that I, a convict in a cell for life, lived in the hours of sleep a life of such happiness that the daytime meant nothing. For Mimsy and I were together each night in our dreams. Twenty-five years passed by, but then one night, and the dream was true, there was no Mimsy. I dreamed again, but, but the door of our little house was closed. There was no, no Mimsy to open it. Mimsy, she was gone. Lost forever. Lost and with her, my mind and my soul. <laughs> This man is insane, Warden, and it's my opinion that he's dangerous. There's nothing to do but send him to the asylum. I'm sorry, Peter. Peter, do you hear me? Hmm. Yeah. Yes, Warden, it makes no difference. She's dead. Mimsy's dead. Mimsy? Who do you mean by Mimsy? Mimsy. Mary. The Duchess of Towers. The the Duchess of Towers? Yes. Why, yes. Yes, she is dead. It's just been reported in the papers. I lost all wish to dream and I lived as other men. No, 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 not as other men, but as a man gone mad. I weakened myself by starvation. And then in my exhaustion I slept... I slept and I dreamed. I walked by the little lake in the woods. The water was calm and quiet. I looked at it and suddenly an idea came into my mind. For down there in its depths was peace. And then a figure came along the path, deep out of the shadow of the woods. Peter, go, go, at last you've come. I knew you would. Mary. Mimsy. Is it you? You're so different. I hardly know you. Yes, Peter. You've changed, too. Before, we were always young, as we were when our dreams first met. But now all that is over. You are old. And my life on Earth is done. 
I can stay only a little while. I have come such a long way, and I must return. Please, you must tell me what to do. Wait a little while. Wait? That is all I can tell you. There is a moment when we shall meet and be inseparable forever. But you must not hurry that moment. Time is nothing, but it must not be destroyed. Mary, don't go away from me again. Yes, I must. But my spirit will always be here with you. Come here to rest and to remember when your body sleeps. And now, kiss me goodbye for a little while. Pimsy. Time is nothing, but I shall count the hours. The hours till I see you again. I have written this down for you to read when I'm gone. I have gone back to the little lake night after night, in the lovely spring and in the autumn sunshine, to take dream notes to be learned by the spirit. And now I can't, I can't, I can't. Gogo, why are you waiting? Come with me. Mimsy, why you've come back. I'm dreaming and, and you've come back to me in my dream. No, this is no dream. For dreams must end. Gogo, give me your hand. Then the dream is ended, Mimsy. For life is but a sleep and a sleep and a forgetting. This, Mimsy, this is our awakening. Mimsy. The curtain of the NBC University Theater falls on another in our series of radio plays based on the world's great stories. Tonight you have heard an adaptation by Jack C. Wilson of the George du Maurier novel Peter Ibbotson, starring Joseph Schildkraut, eminent star of the stage and screen, with Barbara Fuller as the Duchess of Towers. Others in the cast included Jerry Farber, Anne Whitfield, Rudolph Anders, Charlie Lung, Johnny McGovern, Peter Rankin, Ina Ronsley, and Lester Sharp. We invite you to listen again next week when the NBC University Theater presents The Purloined Letter by Edgar Allan Poe, starring Adolf Manju. Music for tonight's production was composed by Albert Harris and conducted by Henry Russell. Your director was Max Hutto. Productions of the NBC University Theater are currently being used in conjunction with a course in American fiction under a college by radio plan at the University of Louisville. <laughs> This program came to you from Hollywood. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.